How's it going? There are a lot of you. Um, my name is John Maxwell. I'm a data scientist at Nordstrom, which means I can truthfully tell people I do modeling for Nordstrom. Uh, I don't have to tell them it's statistical modeling. Um, and I'm going to talk about contextual multi-armed bandits. Uh, this is a class of machine learning algorithm, which is super useful. And my goal is to provide some intermediate materials on this topic, um, because as I was researching them and trying to get something into production, I was stuck reading journal articles the whole time. And there's not very good uh, introductory or intermediate materials out there. So the way that this started at Nordstrom was um, in dealing with uh, A-B tests for product recommendations. So um, looks like I'm going to cut off a little bit on the bottom, but that should be OK. Um, so uh, for A-B tests, um, or for product recommendations, we have a multitude of different ways of generating product rec recommendations, uh, lots of different collaborative filtering algorithms or matrix, fac matrix factorization algorithms. Um, and this happens offline, and then uh, we can show those in, uh, in the, the right rail on our product page like that. Um, and, uh, and people um, interact with these a lot. It gets kind of used like a, a extra search. Um, and uh, th so the, the problem occurs when you have um, a whole bunch of different uh, ways of, uh, of giving product recommendations and you want to find out which one's best. Um, so if you're going to try to do A-B testing, this will just take way too long. You'll be A-B testing for like the next 50 years. Um, so we have to come up with a, a more intelligent way of uh, finding out how good our product recommendations are um, compared to other strategies for product recommendations. Um, so that's where we get into uh, just kind of a, a normal multi-armed bandit setting. Um, a normal multi-armed bandit would, would instead of um, when, uh, when, you, when people come to the site um, in A-B testing, you, you, know, you send people to you know, maybe half of the population goes to um, one version and the other half goes to another version. Whereas, um, and it just stays that way for you know, a week or so, and then you calculate results and you choose the best one. Um, with a multi armed bandit, you start to change those distributions, right? So, say you start out 50 50, you start to observe that uh, version two is doing better than version one, so you start sending more traffic to version two. Um, and that allows you to uh, converge more quickly um, to an answer and a result. Um, however, uh, in um, in the case of a contextual multi-armed bandit, um, you're bringing in also the context, so what you know about the people and the products that would allow you to not just find one winner for everybody, but a winner for a specific group of people or uh, a winner in a given context. So you might think about this as um, maybe somebody who is in Seattle, you might want to recommend uh, pants to go along with this t-shirt. But if they're in Arizona, you might want to recommend shorts, right? Um, so that would be a contextual variable. So th in this, um, there's kind of two aspects to a contextual multi-armed bandit. The first is your exploration policy, and then the second is kind of how you learn, or your learning policy. And so um, the, the, the simplest approach is to explore first. So just like A-B testing, traffic comes to your site. You send people to version A, B, C. You learn uh, what happens when you send people to those, and then you deploy the winner after uh, you have enough sample size, right? Um, in uh, in a, another way of um, kind of balancing this trade-off of exploration uh, versus exploitation or, or um, exploring versus using your best knowledge is called epsilon greedy. So in this case, traffic comes in. You send most of your traffic to whatever you think is the current best um, version of your site or version of product recommendations. And then you send a small percentage to the alternatives to continue exploring so you don't get stuck, right? And so... Um, you know, uh, in this case, my epsilon is 10%. Is I spread that evenly across my various alterna alternatives. Um, a little bit more uh, sophisticated approach is an upper confidence bound. Um, and this algorithm, you're basically trying to be optimistic when you're uncertain. And um, there's also a whole bunch of other exploration policies that you can use that I'm not going to talk about because I'm trying to keep this straightforward and give you guys um, some tools for getting something into production. So the way this works is, um, oh no, that's not good. Uh, okay, well, our aspect ratio is a lot. Um, so it, you should still be able to see it. So in this case, all we care about is the upper confidence uh, interval, right? The upper end of our confidence interval. So you don't even need to see the bottom, which is convenient. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so here you see we're, we're calculating a point estimate for the black one and the red one, right? So those are two versions of your site. And then we're also calculating the upper uh, end of the confidence interval. 
right? And in, in this case, we choose whichever one has the higher upper end of the confidence interval. So that's the red one, right? And as you, as you start sending more traffic, your confidence interval shrinks. Um, oh, and now suddenly this confidence interval, even though our point estimate is higher for the black one, the upper confidence level is higher for the red one, and so we choose that because we're optimistic and we don't know much about the situation. Uh, we keep going. Uh, we're back to choosing the option two, and, uh, and then uh, we finish um, with a tie, and you break ties randomly in, in UCB. Um, so then, how could you take this exploration policy and then bring in the contextual variables that would give you the ability to provide more, um, more relevant uh, product recommendations, for example? Um, so we, we know things about people, right? We know maybe where they're at geographically. We know how much money they spent with us um, in the past or what um, types of products they've looked at. Uh, we also know when products are similar to each other. We have measures of that. Um, so how can we include those? Well, a really simple approach to this is to train a, a regression for each arm, right? So say you have three different um, product recommendation strategies you're testing against each other. Um, for each one of those, you regress, regress the reward, so maybe like the amount of purchases people make or the number of times people click on uh, the add to bag button on the site. Um, you regress those rewards on the contexts, right? You do that for each arm, um, and you choose the, the highest arm using that, that upper confidence bound idea. So the way, that, the way this looks mathematically is here. Um, so uh, what this is saying, and uh, it looks sort of um, challenging to work through, but it's really pretty straightforward uh, once you break it down. So uh, the X uh, matrix there is our, um, is our context, so our new context in time T. Um, our, uh, our theta is the, the learned coefficients from our regression model. Um, alpha is a tuning parameter that lets you uh, decide how much you want to explore versus exploit. And then um, you also have the standard deviation, so your covariance times you know, your, your context. Um, and then you take, you do this for each arm. So if there's three arms, you do this three times um, with the three different regression models you've trained. And then you take the arg max of that, um, and, uh, and that's the arm you choose. And you just keep going. Um, and this is happening online. It's pretty easy to work through um, how you would update these different matrices online. Um, and there's a great paper that you can't see the reference for, but I'll show it to you at the end. Um, that walks you through this. And this, the reason I start with this um, explanation is this was the first paper I dug into as I was exploring this literature, and I found it uh, more intuitive than most of the others. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of one of the seminal papers in this space. Um, so, uh, but this, this, this is actually pretty hard to implement, right? Like, you have to be able to have, you need infrastructure for online learning. You need to be, uh, be able to update things quickly. Um, you need to invert a potentially large matrix on every call to the algorithm, right? So that, that covariance matrix is, um, you know, this, uh, like, if you have a lot of features, that's going to become uh, challenging. And, um, and how do you deal with delayed rewards? So if you don't observe the reward uh, before the next time you make the call, how do you update uh, that, um, that, uh, that um, your outcome variable, right? So um, there's actually a really cool trick that you can use to uh, think about this. So um, if you look at this, say, so here we have um, you know, our three different arms. Um, uh, three different strategies for product recommendations, and we're observing rewards. So in the first row is uh, the first time period. We observed that we played arm one, we got a reward of one. The second time we played arm two, we got a reward of 0.5. We played arm three, got a reward of two, and then so on and so forth. Um, you can start to see that this is actually really similar to uh, a supervised learning situation. We're just missing some, some data. We are, we've got partial feedback, right? So how could we get full feedback, how could we fill in those dots? Um, so the way you can do this is called inverse propensity scoring. Um, and uh, um, the reason why you would use the inverse um, propensity or the inverse probability is you want to debias your data. So when you look, look back at this for a second, we, we're, we're collecting a biased data set, right? Uh, if we're using something like epsilon greedy where we're playing um, the arm we think is best with some high probability and the arms we think aren't as good with some lower probability, we're uh, we're over observing that, um, or we're over sampling that good arm, right? Um, so we want to deal with that. So what we can do is we just divide by the probability that p sub i t of a, right? We divide by that, and that unbiases our data set. Um, and then uh, we we take our reward. So the you know if it's if it's um, the amount of money they spent or some other um, real value, 
uh, and divide that by the, our, um, our probability, we can, we can de-bias that data set. And the reason I have this indicator function here, right, the i times that pi x, that's, what that's saying is this is, this is uh, that value is one when um, we're looking at um, a place where our arm chose what was in the data set. So like if, if we're looking in, in row one, it's the times when we chose arm one, right? And in row two, it's when we choose arm two. So we can just fill in that data set with zeros everywhere where we don't have feedback. And then this, this re-weighted um, cost uh, in, when we do have feedback. And the reason why I have it negative here as a cost, um, you'll see in just a second, because if we think about those as costs, we can just think about this as a cost-sensitive classification problem, which is a problem I think most of us know how to deal with, right? Um, so if you think about, yeah, these, this inverse propensity score transformed rewards as costs, we can reduce this to cost-sensitive classification. You can use any cost-sensitive multi-class classification algorithm. Um, and the simplest is probably least squares regression for each arm and an argmin to choose the cost minimizing arm, right? So you, um, but the, the really cool thing is you can do that classification offline. And that's um, what turns this in from like a fairly intractable problem into something that most companies have the infrastructure already set up to do, right? So um, let me take this last bit to, to walk you through how we've done it that, at Nordstrom. Um, so uh, people come to our website, right? Then our, our site calls this thing called Dora, and Dora is a node app that explores. So Dora the Explorer. Um, and, uh, and it explores using Epsilon Greedy. Um, and basically what it does is it goes and it, it uh, calls this TensorFlow serving thing that we have set up. Um, and that TensorFlow serving thing says, okay, this is the arm we think is best because we've done this cost-sensitive classification. Uh, and then Dora chooses the recommendation from TensorFlow with you know, some high probability and then randomly explores with some lower probability. Then the website logs um, the context that it sent to Dora, the arm that Dora said to use, the reward it observed, and the probability with which it played the arm. So Dora sends it not just the arm but also the probability, right? because we need that for that inverse propensity scoring. Um, and so then we just do our offline model training, uh, also using TensorFlow. And, uh, and this whole thing just goes on repeat. And you can, you can, change, your, um, you know, you can change your batch length. Uh, it's, it is kind of independent of that, as long as you're doing, as long as you're, as long as you're de-biasing your data set. Um, and I can't see that. So um, that's all I have for you. I don't want to take too long, because uh, I know I'm in between you and lunch. Um, but uh, do you have questions? Um, sort of, yeah. <laughs> Pieces of it. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Yeah, so um, the question is, uh, it's using Epsilon Greedy. Um, so then how, how are we still learning? Sorry, can you repeat one more time? So back into the algorithm, yeah. Yeah, so you think, of, think about it as two pieces. One is the exploration policy, and one is the learning policy. The learning happens offline. Um, the exploration happens online. Uh, so on each call, um, the, uh, um, in each call, we choose whatever we think is the best arm currently that we've learned offline. Um, with some high probability, and then we explore the other arms with some low probability. And um, uh, then when we log the outcome of what we just did, right, so we log the reward, um, we also log the probability that Epsilon Greedy uh, used, and then we reweight our data set using that. So, um, so then when we learn on the next batch, we have uh, an unbiased data set. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Cool. Oh, thank you.